here. Let me get a, a little bit of a feel for the room. How many people have been working with kids with CI in the classroom, either a little or a lot? Okay. I figure that might be the case for curriculum. Hi. Most people don't come to a curriculum presentation unless they're thinking about using it or they have been using it. How many of you are working in a department in which most or all of the teachers use CI? Yep, that number got smaller. <laughs> Absolutely. So you, you may have some good wisdom to share um, with them or some questions. Um, if you're willing to admit it and you don't have to, is there anybody working with a hostile situation in which the other department members, one or more, um, yes, that's very common too. Don't worry. Um, now, just out of curiosity, were any of those people already hostile before you did CI? Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> that, remember that tiger and stripes things we were doing? Yeah. <laughs> It's very funny. One of the things that often comes up is, you know, my department is very anti whatever, whatever, whatever. And I really have to ask that question. In reality, are they supportive of much? I mean, because some people just are naturally, you know, combative. They just like to be combative. That's how they get their strength. I have a sister like that. From the time she was a little girl, you know, she was like, Bleh! You know, um, and no matter what you say to her, that is her reaction. Her. Yeah, <laughs> he's got a lot of things to say to her. Let me tell you. Um, but he, you know, she, that's always her reaction. It used to drive me crazy. And, and then she fought a really long battle um, with scoliosis and had back degenerative surgery. And she's got like 42 rods in her back. And she was a jerk, a total jerk through the entire process. But it gave her strength. I mean, it really gave her strength. It let her get out her frustrations. That's how she got out her frustrations. And, and I, you just learned not to take it personally because this was how she got her strength. Um, because, um, and maybe you're not this kind of a person, <clears throat> what I realized was she and I are very similar, but we just handle it differently. We both have very high expectations for things, very high expectations for people, events, and my way of dealing with high expectations is to imagine it all in my mind for days and days and days, which ultimately leads to complete disappointment because nothing will ever, ever match my imagination, ever, ever. Um, and I have a child like that who's 28 now, but I remember when he was six, him being in tears the night before his sixth birthday, and I said, Anthony, what's wrong? And he said, it's never going to be as good as I want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> and at 28, he's still dealing with that, you know what I mean? And I, I still do it. My sister Kathy, on the other hand, has very high expectations, and she just expects this much, this much. And when it doesn't turn out the way that, you know, when it, when it turns out that it's down here, okay, she just says, yep, I knew it. It was going to suck, and I knew it. Okay, so her heart is hoping for better, but in her brain she gets some satisfaction. <laughs> we just found our satisfaction in different ways. I found mine in creating the event over and over again. She finds hers in predicting what isn't going to go well. And statistically, she wins out. <laughs> um, truthfully, but she cares very, very deeply. I just misinterpreted that for years and years, thinking that her negative attitude was that she didn't care. The truth is she cares very deeply, um, but she also is very much about being in control of things. So um, almost all those attitudes come from that. Hey, all right, so here's the deal with curriculum. I'm going to show you this teeny tiny bit of, of a very exciting PowerPoint literature. Ooh! I hope it's at least 95% comprehensible. Okay, all right, instructional cycle. All right, how many of you have heard of backwards planning? Woohoo, code word. Okay. So, um, in other words, the question is, we think, okay, this is what we're, we've been trained, what do I need to teach in order to do the curriculum? In order to finish the curriculum, what do I need to teach? Okay. There is not one single curriculum written anywhere that is accessibly completed. None. You know that dreaming of it all in your head? <laughs> that is curriculum, okay? No one has created a curriculum you can actually finish, mm -hmm. ever, really and truly. Um, it just doesn't happen. 
Because the minute, even if it's on paper and that's the end, there's always five or six or ten or twenty or thirty more things you could do, all right, once you, if you had the time. There is no end to a curriculum, all right? So, on paper, this is what backwards planning is. But in reality, since you're never going to get to the end of a curriculum, okay, you can't really backwards plan the way you want to because you're never going to get there. Okay? Now, backwards design is not about the content. Backwards design is about the in-class actions. Okay? Not what information do my students need, but what skills do they need to practice so that by the end of this such and such and thus and such will they be able to do this. And I'm going to tell you again, there isn't one out there written that any teacher can actually accomplish unless your expectations are this low. Because kids do not work in a straight line. You will get ten kids going in a straight line doing the right thing. Only half of them will get to where you think they're going to get. The other half have gone off in this direction, or this direction, or they're stuck back here going like this. Okay. And that's where they end up. Okay. So, in reality, this is a nice concept. It doesn't work. I'm, I really am about concept versus reality, okay? Because I want you people to understand that reality is reality. <laughs> um, so even though you're hearing all these wonderful things about CI, it's still reality. It's not anything other than reality. Can I just add yep. to keep saying it? Like, as an AP language teacher as well, they have these super crazy expectations that, like, AP teachers can te teach 16... 33 sub and even at that level, like, there's no end goal. No. So when people say AP has to do the end goal, like, keep that as a dream as well. We are the biggest suckers in the universe, teachers are, because we are the perfectionists. And we have led ourselves to believe for years and years and years that we can do it, damn it. Okay? Yeah. We can. If only we had. Okay? Mm -hmm. If only we had fill in the blank. Okay? We could do this because we are those people. Okay? That's who we are. If only we had those things. And the people that write and sell these programs know that about us. I'm not kidding. They do. And they feed us that. They feed us that more and more you can do, more and more you can do. And we just continue to buy it. Okay? Bless the perfectionist and set him or her aside, okay? Let's go to the realist. You've got real kids in a real classroom doing real things in real life. This stuff I know you and your people have to create for the people who want you to be a sucker. I get that. They pay your paycheck. I totally get that. Okay? This is what I want you to think about. Let's create a new term. There's this thing I want to do in class. There's this interaction I want to have with my students. There's this exploration I want to have with my students. There's this engaging thing I want us to be involved in. If I want my kids to be in that, what do we need to do first? Think about that, okay? And the that is going to include comprehensible language. How can I do it using comprehensible language? And it doesn't even have to be difficult comprehensible language because if the language is simple but the task is difficult, you have upped the ante in the rigor game. Just up the ante in rigor. Completely. The language does not have to be more difficult for the activity to be more rigorous. All right. So we have a couple of examples up here, things that, that different teachers do in class. So this one here, this is FVR. If you're somebody that wants to incorporate um, independent reading, free voluntary reading, whatever you want to call it, SSR, whatever your department wants to call it, it's such a really powerful, incredible thing to do. What is it you need to do with your kids before, during, and after FVR, okay, to make it work. Before, during, and after, what do you need to do and what do the kids need to be able to do to make it work before, during, and after? Buying the novels is not enough. It just isn't, 
Okay. And little by little, you want to have those conversations with the powers that be up above you that stuff doesn't do it. The curriculum doesn't do it. You also need time for conversation okay, and development of pieces. Less is more, little by little. This piece over here is a smash doodle. Have you guys heard of smash doodles? Okay, so a smash doodle is just kind of a fancy term for a way to summarize something. And it's a combination, it's like a little tiny mini mural, and it's a combination of images and sentences. And you can put any requirements in, into it that you want. This one was from Meyer Canyon's and Carol Gobb's novel, Pirates. <clears throat> and they had certain requirements that they had to fulfill. They had to put some vocabulary words, some images, um, three sentences that really were like crucial to the, to the chapter. And um, then they had three reactions, and they had to do it bothered the, me that. I was surprised to learn that, and I predict um, that, that was on the bottom that they, that they had to do. Now, these are level one kids, all right, at the end of level one, um, that were doing this. And so what we did is there's ten chapters in the book. I knew at the end I wanted them to do this, okay, um, but I didn't tell them we were going to do this at all. And as we went through the book, and we went through the chapters, and we read it together as a class, I was keeping in mind that we wanted to do this. And just in case you're interested in doing smash doodles and not losing your mind, okay, <laughs> here's a way of doing it. My colleague made up this great rubric, which if you email me, and my, my information is on all of the things, um, I can send to you. And it's basically just a step-by-step -step thing. Do this, do that, do this, do that, do this, do that. And if the kids follow it, they'll get all the little sweet points they need on a rubric. Um, <clears throat> but what I had them do was I handed out an index card with the chapter number on it when the book was finished, when we'd finished the book. And so my kids that struggled a little bit more with reading, I, I gave chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three, because chapter four is usually where books get complicated. If you want to know the real reading level of a book, don't look at the first two, three chapters. Go to the middle. Go to chapter four. That's when the plot starts to get complex and the language gets to get more complex. And the first three chapters are often written in a different voice not intentionally, all right, but in the first three chapters, what do you have to do? The setting, the plot, and the characters, okay? So chapter four, you know, there it comes. Um, so the first three chapters were for the kids that I knew were my struggling readers. I wanted them to be really successful. Um, the other chapters went to my higher achievers. And now we'd all read the book. They'd all read all the chapters, all right? And they were just responsible for one, and they had to do a smash doodle on it. That's okay. Yes. Yes. That's really good. Thank you for tying that back. So I kind of jumped from one activity to the other. With FVR, there are certain things that you want to do. And the first thing you need to do with kids first is to read as a class so that you can see where they are and what they can do. And talk about what skills you want them to have. But then you want them to be able to self-evaluate, which is a good book for me to read. When they're trying to self-evaluate their reading level, Chapter 4 is a good place to go. Just open up to one page in Chapter 4. And We do, we had talked about the drop and drag in the last session where you put an index card down and then you drag the card down. So what I tell the kids is, park the card, okay? Every time you come across a sentence, you can't picture the meaning of in your head. If you have parked the card three times, that book's too hard for you. Okay. If you three. three. But depending on my group, you know, some of my kids, if they park it twice, it's too hard for them because they, they're like, <laughs> after the first time. So, but generally, I say three, three times. My upper-level kids who are used to that kind of testing, they like it. They kind of are up for it. They, sometimes I'll tell them four, um, but they get to, they get to know. Um, and so for this thing, what we did was each kid created a smash doodle, and for each chapter, they had to pick three sentences out of the chapter, some vocab words, and then their own opinions. I had four classes of Spanish one, 30-some kids a chapter, or 30-some kids a class. So I had 120 coverages. So, but what I was able to do in each class is get one smash doodle for each chapter. So on this wall, I put chapters 1 through 10 for 10 of the kids. 
10 different kids made this summary of the whole book. And then in this while, I could do 10 more kids' summaries of the book. Same book, same chapters, different kids. Chose different sentences, drew different pictures, and had different thoughts at the bottom. And we eventually covered all the walls with about seven different complete and total summaries, chapter by chapter, of the book. And then they got to go and reread <laughs> chapter to chapter to chapter. Now, basically what I told them was, I just want you to go and look at the things and vote for the two that you thought were clearly, you know, they had little awards they had to give, most clearly written, best illustrated, pick the best sentences from the novel, you know, just things to get them to reread. But in reality, they read a summary of the book seven times as they went around the room to do it. So it was a really useful way to get kids to reread. They had to reread to create the smash doodle. Then they had to reread as they, as they went around without my going, ha ha, you're rereading, ha ha, <laughs> um, to do that. And what I found was a lot of kids who missed things that we did in class, like maybe they were absent or they were daydreaming or the whatever, they're like, oh, that's what happened. <laughs> and then suddenly it made sense for them. Yeah, now that makes sense. Absolutely, absolutely. So I would suggest that as a kind of a, as a reading thing. But in order for them to be able to do it, um, I had to make sure, okay, as we went through, that we had done these prediction things in class. All right, these three things needed to be not brand new for them. So what surprised you in this chapter? By the time we got to the smash doodle, these were very familiar with that for them, and they knew what they meant and how to answer them and, and how to express um, what they felt. And also they had to be able to really comprehend it. So I had to make sure that kids who were reading at a certain level got the beginning chapters. Now, the one in the middle... <laughs> um, this is, and I made this point earlier in one of the presentations, and I, I, I don't think we can make it strongly enough in a CI classroom. In a CI classroom, you take what is a disaster and turn it into a success. Okay? Whatever might make you want to hit a wall or a child okay, in a normal, different classroom, in this particular idea, you want to say, how can I turn this into a plus? How can I turn this minus into a plus? What can I do? Well, I had a, a kids who were eating in my room. And I didn't have a vacuum cleaner, and I didn't have a sweeper, and I was getting in trouble because kids were leaving crumbled goldfish all over the room. And I was really tired of it. And I'd already been with the lecture and the whatever and the whatever and whatever. And I'm like, there's 40 of you in this class. I cannot figure out who's dropping the goldfish. I just can't see it. So I said, all right, I'm gonna, we're going to work with the goldfish. I'm going to find a way to m make this point. So I cleaned up the room except for these three goldfish and put yellow police stone crimes around it. <laughs> and then when they came in, okay, all right, they had to each examine the scene. Okay, they were in a group and um, each group had a different job and uh, I had to think about this ahead of time to figure out what they needed to do. So what they needed to be able to do in five minutes was observe the scene, okay, and sketch it. They needed to do that. They needed to write down facts about the scene in the target language. And so this is good practice for them about saying what you know how to say. And like, um, where did the, these are level three kids. So where did the crime occur? Okay, can you tell what time the, the crime occurred from the evidence that's there? Um, then in another group, when they were another five minutes, they, they got, as a group, they had to write up a theory. Okay, I think that, this was level three, so they were doing subjunctive. I think that so-and-so entered the room. I think that so-and-so ate something. I think that so-and-so surprised somebody, whatever. Um, but it was fun. And they wanted to do it again, and they wanted to do it again, and they wanted to do it again. And what happened was I ended up with this group of kids that after about five different crimes that occurred in the room, um, they were able to really, really use the language. So it actually was accidental backwards planning. <laughs> um, but now that I've done it with the kids, now I know how to, to set it up ahead of time so it would be even more successful. Um, but it's this combination of taking what could drive you crazy and, and working with it and going forward with it and not, not using it as a stimulant. But the idea is what do they need to be able to do? And this goes back to what I've been trying to say to the different groups all day long. Observe and record. Listen and understand. Ask the right questions. Try to get the answers. Make a prediction and see what happens. And those themes keep coming up over and over and over again in whatever we do, whether we're talking about the weekend, 
okay, or whether we're talking about a novel or whether we're talking about a video to a song. And it's the same thing. What do you observe? What do you hear? What's the picture in your heart and mind? Is it the same one as the person who's trying to deliver the message to you? Is the picture that you get the same as the picture that you get? Because that's important in reading. When you read that, what did you see in your head? When you read it, what did you see? What's the difference between what's in her head and what's in her head? Let's go back and read that paragraph again all right, and see if we can get a clear picture by putting all of it together and do that. So this concept of coming back to that language of what's the picture in your head, what's the picture in your heart of this, super powerful, super powerful to come back over and over again. So think about inspirational planning. What do I need to do with my students in order for them to be able to do this. Now, there's one caveat at the end of this that I need to tell you, and that is without losing my sanity, okay? Without losing my san sanity, because if you are out there on the internet looking at what's out there and you see Annabelle Allen, okay, and then the next video you go to, okay, Erica Poplinski. Okay, and then the next one you go to, somebody else, and somebody else, and this person has a breakout box, and this person has a that, and this, and you're like, oh my God, I can't do that. I can't be all those people. I can't. No, no, no. Everything you do, you have to end with, excuse me, Matt, could you plug your ears for a minute? <laughs> Give me five, dude. Nice. Okay, so Matt, I, I hope this isn't too, you know how, you, well, I don't have to, actually, I don't have to. If you know what I'm talking about, you'll know, and he may not. You know when you read a fortune cookie? Oh, yeah. yeah. And you add something to the end of it? Yeah. Okay. If you don't know this, ask somebody outside of class, and they'll tell you. Okay, the thing you're adding to the end of this is without losing my sanity. Okay, we're not here to have you lose your sanity. We're here to have you keep it. So I don't care how good the idea is. I don't care how impressive Annabelle Allen is when she does it. I don't care. If it's going to cause you to lose your sanity, it's not for you. You are lovable and wonderful and terrific, and actually so is Annabelle, but, and, and, and fantastic and all of those things, okay? okay? And you can be none of them unless you have your sanity. So do that first. Be yourself first. Do that first. This is really and ultimately about do you care about this kid in front of you? Have you communicated to this kid in the first language and the second language and body language and every other language that you can do that's legal in school? Have you communicated to this that this child means a lot to you and that their success means a lot to you, but that your personal success, success doesn't depend on it? Okay, you're, do not let them think that your personal success depends on their success. My personal success depends on me. My kids do not make my personal happiness. If I'm giving them that message, I'm putting a burden on them that is unnecessary. My job is to be happy and to help you be happy. And if you're doing that, you're doing a great job. You are doing a fantastic job because that's all you can do in teaching. Teaching is a prayer. Okay? You get up every day, you put your hands together, and you hope to God it comes out right. And that's all you can do. That's all you can do. And then after that, the rest of the world takes over. And there isn't anything else you can do. So when we get to here, boom, boom, come back. What have I got next? Okay, now, do you want some language that you can give to your people so that they can, it looks like you really know what you sound like you're talking about? Good, I can do that. I'm going to put a lot of it up on the site, okay? But there are a lot of things um, that you can say. And what you want to do is lift and steal official sounding language particularly from actful, that's very helpful, okay? And then fill in the blank, okay, with things that you want to have your kids say and do. The, the most challenging job that we have when it comes to curriculum and assessment is this. Language is messy, 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 messy. Assessment is clean, 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 clean. <laughs> so to measure messy assessment, or me measure messy proficiency with clean assessment is really very difficult. Um, so there are a lot of things, and feel free to snap a picture, okay? Um, and I can explain the FSs in another thing at another time because we're short on time in here. All right. Now, this is fancy language for people, okay? This is the language you write up, and it makes your administrator happy, even though they probably don't know what you're talking about. This is what you need for your classroom. 
Okay? This is what you put down so you know what you're doing. By the time I'm done, we've done a story about Kevin in my class. And when, by the time I'm done with this, okay, kids should be able to listen to and comprehend a story similar to the story we did about Kevin. Kevin had to go to the bathroom. He forgot to go to the bathroom. He needed to go to the bathroom. We talked about all of Kevin's adventures, trying to get out from his class where the teacher wouldn't let him go to the bathroom. Okay? <laughs> and so I want my kids to be able to understand a similar story okay, about a kid who needs to make a phone call and can't make a phone call and forgot to make the phone call. Dad's going to be mad because he didn't make the phone call. Now he has to get out of a class that the teacher won't let him make a phone call and go make a phone call. It's similar to the Kevin story about going to the bathroom, but it's not the Kevin story, okay? And the discussion around it, okay? In what classes can you leave the room? Okay. What do you do when you have a problem? Do you lie? Do you tell the truth? Okay. How many times a year can you leave a class? I mean, whatever conversation you had around it, you want them to be able to have a similar conversation. Okay. <coughs> so that you can do the following very complicated things. Complicated and educated are lovely. We talk a lot about feeding the need in this area of teaching. And if you're going to keep your job and change the world, you got to make a lot of people happy. So making administrators happy means using language that makes administrators happy. Connecting with your department and speaking their language when they only speak actful means you need to be able to speak some actful. Okay? If you don't speak, you know, the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages speak, all right, we can give you speak that does that so that you can communicate to them. Even though all you want to do is talk about the Kevin story in your class. Because some CI people just want to do the Kevin story. Other CI people or non-CI people are really, really concerned about these things because academically this is what we're asking kids to do. And it's really kind of cool and important if you're into that kind of thing. Our goal is really not to separate people, it's to bring them together. So if you feel like you're in a situation in which you are separated, talk to somebody and look for ways to bring them together. And if that doesn't work, ask me, I'll help you out. Okay? How do you bring people together? Common language, common goals. Okay, common language and common goals will do it. That might mean that you have to pick up some common language, <laughs> okay? All right. And it might mean that you have to look at your goals in a different way, but so will they. I think also as a department chair, it helps to know this language because when that teacher is transferred to the evaluation process, it's all in this language. Mm -hmm. While we love the Kevin story and the Kevin story's work, we sound more administrative and professional. Yeah. Yes, it absolutely does. And, you know, I, I know people on all parts of this, this spectrum, you know, and there's no wrong place to be. If you're a person who loves this language, and frankly I do, I kind of like messing with it and playing with it, you know you've got my Danielson rubric, you know, rewritten. I like playing with it. It's kind of fun. Um, but not everybody does, and it isn't necessary to be a good teacher. However, some people have it. And, and if we're going to work together as a community going forward, we need to talk to each other. And this, we have to come together in language. All right. And so you can do this with all of the skills. All right. You go from simple, and it just keeps going. Okay. This is that sanity situation that we need to try to avoid. So don't try to eat the whole elephant at once. You know the expression, how do you eat an elephant? One, One bite, bite at a time. time. Yeah, It's really all you can do. It's that perfectionism thing again. You cannot overwhelm your entire, overvamp your just complete curriculum in five days. Nor can you change your department. Salud! In five days. Nor can you do any of it in five days. You can only eat an elephant one bite at a time, otherwise you vomit. And then you've got to start all over again. Okay? And that's a terrible feeling, the vomiting and the starting over again. So, <laughs> so little by little is okay. And if other voices tell you it's not, smile and ignore them. If other voices tell you you must go faster, higher, deeper, whatever, 
Smile <laughs> and ignore them because it cannot be done. And don't let the perfectionist in your head tell you that it can be because it can't. All right. Now, this is another piece of paper that I will upload for you. I'm so sorry I didn't do these things ahead of time, um, but I finished my year, moved out of my room, moved out of my house, moved into a car, and got here all in five days. So it's been a kind of crazy time period. So I, all of this next week when I'm sitting in an Airbnb will be uploaded, I promise. Um, this is called the Guaranteed, Guaranteed Success Grid for Speaking and Writing. This was based on the New York State Proficiency Test and designed for students to take at the end of level one in New York State before they cut the funding. For it. Uh, yeah, this is the, there's a Regents, which is designed for level three. This is a proficiency, which, which is designed for level one at the end of two middle school years of study. And so we took 10 years of that test, and we went over it with a fine-tooth comb, looking at what was required for Spanish and French, and it came down to these little teeny tiny lists. If your kids could produce these, if they could produce these, they could get an 80 on the test. Now, obviously, their ability to understand is far greater than this list. But after two years, if they could produce it, they could get an 80. So imagine what the, how much of it they had to get to just get a 65, if you're passing grade to 65. So we started with this. This was our core, and we built from these. And so if you've heard of the Super 7, if you've heard of the Sweet 16, mm -hmm. if you've looked at those things, they are really powerful and important. And start that as your core and grow out. Other language will naturally emerge because you cannot use language in isolation, okay? If the sweet 16 is 16 verbs, you cannot possibly talk about those 16 verbs without bringing other verbs in, okay? You can't talk about being thirsty if you don't also use the verb drink, okay? It just doesn't work that way. If you talk about being hungry, you're going to talk about eating, okay? And so other verbs come into play, and other things are acquired, but the reality of it is those give a solid sticking point because when it comes to circumlocution and saying what you need to say and getting where you need to go with what you've got, those verbs will get you there. All right? And then you just build from there. And that's what we found that we needed to do for a test. Now, does anybody else here have to teach to a test? Oh, thank God. Okay. Ultimately, this was created not for real life, but for a test. So we knew for our kids, okay, to do well on the test, they would need to know these things. But let's take a look at them for a second. How many of these are high frequency or high value structures that you might use in real life? Anything up there that jumps out at you that wouldn't be? Oh, All right, yes, in order to, right. And numbers are not Ah, yes. But you know they're going to show up on those dumb tests. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is what it comes right. down to. There's always some give and take, okay? If you want to be a whole... CI purist, okay? You can throw out all of these things and just follow crash and, and, and do it. And it's so beautiful and it's so lovely, but it'd be really hard to find and keep a job. Okay? Cause, because most schools don't work that way. 99.999% of schools don't work that way. And the reality of it is you can't change the world if you're not teaching kids. You can't teach kids if you don't have a job. So you've got to keep a job along with keeping your sanity. But the cool thing is this. This was created to fill a need to pass a test to keep a job. But 99% of it, or 95% of it, is actually really good, useful language. So this was created because we had a colleague who insisted that what we were doing was not useful. Okay? So now we have common language. We're going to build our curriculum around this. She's going to do the same thing because she knows what's necessary for the test. She may do it in her way, we may do it in our way, but we're all doing the same thing now all together. And the relief for me was that it's basically the core same stuff. But I needed to put that on paper for my colleague to see it. Okay? And sometimes that's what we have to do. What if like, you are able to have a complete CI department? Like, we're in an opportunity where, at our school where we can actually get all of our teachers to do it now, but we're in a step 
where, <laughs> where like, we're all kind of new at it, so should we still be going with this goal of useful language? I mean, it's great yeah. that we're all on the same page, but we're kind of right. in this now what phase. Now what, now where, right? right. And part of that is because we're so trained to have on paper what our goals are and where we're, where we're, where we're getting to and, and academically check off the little boxes and make sure we did them all. We've all been trained that that's what's what we have to do. Um, but, but, but when you think about it, ultimately, language is organic. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I, I, for years, probably, my, I, I've done this for 20 years now. My first 10, I was like, okay, I brought this with me to class. And I had kids check it off every time I said something that was on one of these words, okay? My high achievers made a check mark every day on it, and I counted to make sure that I covered every single one of these suckers for 10 years, okay? And finally, I realized I was. <laughs> and I no longer needed kids to count it because it's, language is natural. So if I talk about my day and my kid's day, and a novel kid's day, and a kid in a movie's day, and a kid in a commercial's day, okay, and an in, a made-up kid's day, what are we going to talk about? The same thing over and over and over again. Right? Language is organic. You talk about what you know or what you want to talk about. So as long as you stay focused, the words will come up over and over and over and over and over and over again. What you need to decide as a department is how much of a checklist are you comfortable with. And the bottom line comes down to this. What do you need if one of your people can no longer be there? So that if someone replaces him or her, what is it that they need? That's really what curriculum is for. I know that sounds dumb. But, no. <laughs> but come back to reality again. What you really need is a document that somebody else can work off of should one of your team not be there. Or how many of us have been a new teacher where there is nothing there? Yeah. And you don't know where to go or what to do and what's expected of you. Yeah, it's horrible. So that's really what curriculum does. That's the real practical use of it. So that's what you have to ask yourself. What do we need this year? And then take a look at it, build a skeleton, and then fill in the blanks next year and just keep adding the details. Get the basic idea of the picture mm -hmm. yeah. and keep adding the details. Isn't it as a curriculum mapping or there's just sort of back design? My school, so we have a PLC and I'm PLC, so it's not department PLC, but there's four strands. So there's French with me and then there's Heritage Spanish, dual language Spanish, and traditional Spanish. And I'm not sure that I can convince my colleagues to move to something like that. I think they're going to go look at the grammar focused, the traditional 88 CFC or the CLEP, and say they need to right. go this tense and we do that in Spanish 4, and we do this in Spanish 3. And mm -hmm. How do I help the three strands of Spanish kind of map this all out when we're hiring two new people? And how do we write a curriculum for heritage that we have zero? This, the shift that you have to make when you've got people all over the board, okay? It's not so much what do they need by the end, but at, at what point can I start it? Okay. Because there's this possessiveness that happens in which you cannot do that in level three. Because I'm doing it in level four. And if you do it in level three, it'll already be done. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> uh, and, and that really doesn't make sense because you know in level four they still are trying to remember things from level one. So why are you yelling at the level one teacher? Do it more! Do it more! You know? The more we do it, the better we do it. Yeah, and so, again, these are these things we've been trained to believe. So it's not like they must have this by the end of level two or the end of three, but, but when do you want to start it? When are you comfortable starting it? If you can get people to agree that there's no end point, we're never going to stop teaching the future tense. We're never going to stop using the preterite. We're never going to stop using direct object pronouns. <laughs> you know, if you can just agree to that, and figure out when people are comfortable starting, then you're okay. Um, because what's the latest we need to start using direct object pronouns? We're all, we teach in this huge, gigantic department in a big district. We all teach Spanish, levels one through four, all of us, okay? What is the latest you would be comfortable introducing an indirect object pronoun? There you go. You, you, as a, you, come to go, you come to consensus, okay? You come to consensus. When is the latest you're comfortable introducing it? And go with that. Because... Is there an outside measure to help nope. make that consensus? No, because nobody really knows the order of acquisition. And it's different for each language. 
and it's different in different circumstances. A native speaker's order of acquisition may be different than a second or third or fourth language acquisition. If I already know Portuguese, my order of acquisition is going to be different than if I, I know Chinese. You know, it's just it's going to be different. But you, you try to find a common ground, um, even if it's tiny, find a common ground. And then the more common ground you have, the more common ground you will train yourselves to find. You know, but ultimately, when it comes to curriculum, what we're trying, really, let's face it, we're all playing catch-up. What's the latest I can do this? <laughs> you know, I have to get this in by the end of whenever. I have to get this in by the That's how we all teach. Oh, my gosh, I haven't done that yet. I have to do this now. So as long as you know in your mind when the end is for introducing it, you'll all end up in a, in a similar place. My next question would be, what happens when you, as a team, don't get to all these different Let me just ask. Does it happen now? Does anybody now have a curriculum which everybody gets to everything? Mm -hmm. You say, there you go. <laughs> and that's my, the only way to get there. You have AP to be realistic. Swear, not AP language. My AP and other colleagues swear they do. Yes. Oh, I never get to yeah. Funnel, 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 funnel. Goose, 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 goose. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So like that's one thing the Spanish team this year, when they brought it to PLC, would say, like, oh, well, you know, we put this MTSS time in and we've lost these many instruction minutes, so we're one unit behind where we were last oh, year. Gee. How are we going to catch this oh, up? Gee. And I kind of said, what can your kids communicate? Like, what are they doing? Where's the data? Where's the work? It looks right. like they're still writing. It looks like we're discussing with the other teams. We're so you stitch in, you know, one vocab unit. Or yeah. It's hard, but it's a process. And not everybody will get to it. Not, not everybody will get to it. It depends on your leadership role and what you're allowed to, to put down as leadership. You know, are you allowed to smack it down and say, guess what, it doesn't matter. I'm the leader and I say it doesn't matter. I've been given that job and it doesn't matter. Okay? Or do you have to say, well, now... My experience has taught me, and I just met with 35 other teachers from across the country, and they also said that ideally this is a curriculum, and really this is a curriculum. Everybody has a curriculum that's this big, but in reality we're all getting here, and so we're no different than any other school, at least among the 35 that I just spoke to. Um, so um, let's go with real, okay, and, and, and go with that, because we can only do that. It, it could take a couple of years for te people to get there, but God, what a relief to be teaching real instead of impossible. What, they're, what you need to do, though, is, is have a, but you have to have a, a community in which it's okay mm -hmm. to say, we didn't make it this far. And I hope to be forgiven for my sin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and, and oftentimes that's hard to do within your own department. Mm -hmm. It's hard to speak reality to your people. It's hard. It's very hard to do that. And sometimes you need to bring in a quote from someone. If you need one, please email me and I will find somebody to quote for you. The truth is that we want to look and sound a different way than we absolutely are. And bringing truth to a department that doesn't want to speak the truth um, is maybe one of those um, impossible dreams that you can't actually make happen. Um, people's identity is very much tied up into what they believe they are doing. And when you start saying to people, no, you're not actually doing that, it doesn't sit very well. But I'm going to go back to what I said in the other presentation. I think it was the other presentation. When I ask, I think I'm losing track. When I ask teachers who don't use a CI method, of any kind of CI in their classes, if a kid gets an 80 on the test in June, in the final exam, and I give the test again seven or eight weeks later with no preparation, no warning, and they take the test again, those teachers are almost, almost always happy if the kid gets a 30% on the test.
They only, only anticipate that kids will retain 30% of what the previous teacher has taught. I mean, that's what review is for, right? How many of you are taught in a district where the first six to eight to 12 weeks of the year are review? So please don't tie me to a pole and lash me because my, I didn't get to the clothing unit. You only expected 30% of them to remember 30% of it, okay? You know, and I, and I think we, if, we, if we can kindly and gently say that, you know, what you need to say is you, I know, have a great review process at the beginning of the year. And so if my kids are a little weak on the clothing end, I'm pretty confident you'll catch them up. Okay? Go for what you know they're good at and what they value and what they can do and just, just tell them what they're good at and say, my kids need that from you. I know you're really, really strong at direct object pronoun instruction, and we did it, we did it last year, but this group just needed more time, and I'm sure you're the right teacher for it. <laughs> you know? And they probably are because the kids will be more ready. Um, but the reality of it is you can't change people. They can only change themselves. And until then, you can only admire their sparkles. Okay? Because if you admire their sparkles, then they're, more, they're better people if you admire their sparkles. Everybody's good when you tell them they're good. You know? If you just look at them and go, oh, gosh, the kids are going there next year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and communicate that somehow to the kids or the parents or to the colleague or whatever, you're, you're, you're perpetuating the problem. Um, so we all have to look for the best in each other. That's why I said, don't forget, these are your colleagues too, okay? These, these are your colleagues. So, you know, little by little by little. And remember, let go of that bracelet that you made, okay? That's also the ideal CI department. <laughs> in CI program, it's never going to look like that. It's always going to be messy, okay? You might need a bunch of safety pins, and you may have to retie it seven or eight or nine or ten times. It's okay. Um, there's a, a teacher in, in uh, Arizona who's retired, Brian Barabee, and uh, Brian has said to me over and over and over again, there's this mantra in yoga that he uses, and he said it's so CI and so TPRS, and he says, you are where you are supposed to be, even if that is a recognition of you need to be somewhere else. <laughs> okay? So whatever moment you're in, wherever people are, it's where they need to be for whatever reason they need to be there. Your need may be to take them somewhere else, but their need may to be there. But if you just accept you are where you need to be and they are where they need to be and just accept that, then you can go a lot farther. And I have had those words in my head from Brian over and over and over and over and over again that if I'm frustrated, it's okay. If those people are frustrated, it's okay. We'll get somewhere eventually. It's okay because... The frustration we're feeling is going to help us grow to a new place. The hunger we're feeling for something new is going to lead us to a new place. Have you heard the, the expression, um, discomfort is a precursor to growth? Yeah. Okay. Make some mantras for yourself. <laughs> Put them on a bracelet. <laughs> and wear them around. And support each other. Ask each other. Because curriculum is, is best served shared. Okay, it really is. So everybody doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. So figure out what your bases are. Figure out what your basics are. And grow everything from the center out. All right. And Bryce is coming in next, I believe, to her. Yay! Thank you. And don't forget to ask.